Last time in our series on the Peloponnesian War, the dashing Admiral Alcibiades had led the Athenian navy against the island of Sicily, despite multiple bad omens warning against such an expedition. Much like Vietnam for the United States, Afghanistan for the Soviet Union, or Greece for the Achaemenids, the Athenian Empire would face a long due humbling in Sicily. How did the Sicilian campaign unfold? What happened to Alcibiades? And why did the rising superpower of Hellas end up losing so badly? Welcome to our video on the Sicilian Expedition, the greatest interlude of the Peloponnesian War and its disastrous consequences. This series on the Peloponnesian War is kindly sponsored by our YouTube members and patrons, and the series has been initially released as an exclusive for our supporters. Right now, the patrons and YouTube members are watching our first Punic War and Pacific War series, while the series on the history of Prussia and Italian Unification Wars Risorgimento have been concluded, and our series on the Russo-Japanese War and Albigensian Crusade and Xenophon's Anabasis will be released next. You can join their ranks via the links in the description and pinned comment to get exclusive videos, early access to all public videos, see our schedule, access a special Discord server in which we are very active, and much more. Thank you for supporting us, we couldn't be doing it without your help. Since Sicily has only been briefly mentioned in this series, we will begin with a basic history and geopolitical survey of the island. Sicily has been on the radar of the Hellenic world since the Bronze Age, and in the early Archaic period, Greek and Phoenician colonies were built on the Sicilian coast. By the 4th century BC, Sicily had many colony city-states, and a political scene just as complex as the one in mainland Greece. The biggest city was Syracuse, a rich merchant hub which regularly switched between tyrannical and democratic governments. Syracuse was very protective of its sphere of influence on the island, opposing foreign interventions and trying to mediate intra-island conflicts in its favour. Athens, for its part, had some cultural and political ties to the smaller Ionian colonies on the island, and saw them as a counterweight to Syracuse. Meanwhile, Sparta had similar ties to the island's Dorian colonies, including Syracuse. Despite this, Athens's military intervention in Sicily in 415 BCE was a new frontier for them, unprecedented in scale. The military commitment was massive, consisting of 5,100 hoplites, 480 archers, 700 slingers, 120 other light infantry, 30 cavalry, and 134 triremes. Along with it were Nicias and Alcibiades, the city's top generals, alongside Lamachos. As Athens set sail, the Hermes scandal festered, as witnesses were called and Athens's quasi-political mystery clubs were blamed. Alcibiades was involved in some of the oligarchic clubs, though Donald Kagan believes he was not part of the sacrilege. Athens gathered troops from its allies and set sail, arriving first on the east coast of southern Italy near Regium in modern-day Calabria. Many coastal cities gave them a cold reception, fearing the chaos of war coming to their shores, and Regium echoed this sentiment. Nicias claimed this lack of support showed the futility of their campaign. In response, Alcibiades instead suggested a diplomatic love-bombing campaign across Sicily. Lamachos, an old Korea soldier, had a third plan, simply to sail to Syracuse and seize the city. However, he eventually sided with Alcibiades, and diplomacy began. Meanwhile, the government of Syracuse was engaged in a debate about how to deal with the Athenian attack. General Hermocrates pushed for capitulation, demanding an alliance be formed against Athens, while his counterpart, Athenagoras, considered fear of the Athenians to be unsound. While this was happening, Athens moved down south, gaining allies along the coast of Sicily, like the city of Naxos, before reaching Messenia, a town which let them into their territory and allowed them to set up their camps in Catana. Around this time, a trireme from Athens arrived, asking Alcibiades to return to be tried for the sacrilege. Alcibiades agreed to return. However, while they were passing through the Athenian colony of Thurii, he mysteriously disappeared. He was not found, and when the ship left empty-handed, he resurfaced and sailed to the Peloponnese. Thus, Nicias was left as the de facto head of the Athenian army in Sicily, 
overseeing a strategy he opposed, but one his troops demanded he continue. Nicias wanted to avoid engaging with Syracuse's superior cavalry, so he devised an ingenious plan. He dispatched a secret agent to claim that the Athenians had stored their weapons away from their camp. Syracuse eagerly accepted the story and left their city. At dawn, the Athenians and their allies landed covertly just outside the city and took up positions between the coast and the Temple of Zeus, a position fortified by slopes and the sea. There, they built up a fortified stockade. The Syracusans only realized their mistake when they arrived at Catana and saw the Athenian camp there empty. By the time the Syracusans had hightailed it back, Athens had the advantage and was in a position the Syracusan cavalry could not reach. The armies clashed the very next day. The Athenians placed their own troops in the center, the Argives and Mantineans on their right near the coast and their other allies on the left. The Syracusan army was about the same size, with the cavalry on its right. The Athenians charged first, surprising the Syracusans, but the locals managed to fight back. The fight was intense, but the left flank of Syracuse began to wane under an elite push by the Argives. Athens then pushed from their center and caused the Syracusans to flee. However, Due to their need to stay in a narrow spot where the enemy cavalry couldn't break their lines, the Athenians did not pursue further. The Athenian inferiority in cavalry now prevented them from turning their victory into a rout. The Syracusans went to the road to Helipus, as Athens broke the bridge towards the main city of Syracuse. Syracuse lost 260 men, while Athens lost 50 men, and appeared to be in a strong position to threaten the city. In the aftermath of the battle, the Syracusans took positions on the hill of the Temple of Zeus, close to the left flank of the Athenian army. Nicias then retired to Catani for the winter, being cautious not to attack the city instantaneously. Athens had succeeded in its first onslaught on Syracuse, but a gruelling siege was to follow. Meanwhile, Syracuse sent envoys to Corinth, who agreed to send troops to them. The envoys then moved to Sparta. Simultaneously, Alcibiades had arrived in Sparta and was terrifying them with supposed Athenian plans to take over Sicily and Carthage to forge a so-called United States of Force. Sparta sent a Mothax, or half-Spartan half-Helot, called Gylippus, to lead a relief force to Sicily. All told, the reinforcements headed Syracuse's way included 5 to 6,000 hoplites, 1,200 cavalry, and 100 triremes, on top of Gylippus's force of 700 armed sailors, 1,000 hoplites, 1,000 indigenous Sikho warriors, and 100 cavalry. In the spring of 414 BCE, Athens began the siege. They moved by sea down to the coast of Leon. They then marched onto the heights via the Pass of Euryalus, where they encountered a force that Syracuse had sent to occupy the hills. There was a clash, but the Syracusans failed to push off the Athenian advance. Athens moved to the city, then commenced its long-practiced strategy of blockade by building walls from Leon to Syracuse's Great Harbour. Two forts were erected at Labdulum at the Western Heights and Sica at the Southern Heights. The Syracusans dashed out to thwart the construction of these stockades, but were unable to form a line and were forced to withdraw. Syracuse built its own wall from the southwest to cut off Athens. Athens waited for a while as the wooden wall was being built, and then struck back, deploying 300 hoplites and heavily armored light troops to capture an outpost near the wall, causing the defending garrison there to flee. Nevertheless, Syracuse continued building their wall, extending it across a marsh near the Great Harbour. Athens tried to strike again and split the Syracusan force in two, one towards the city to the right and one towards the Anapus River to the left. The 300 hoplites moved behind the left flank, but were routed by the Syracusan cavalry, who then attacked the Athenian right. Both wings were routed, and old man Lamachos was killed in the battle. Syracuse only retreated when the main bulk of the Athenian army arrived. Syracusan troops who had previously fled resurfaced from the city and formed up. While engaging the Athenians, 
others went and destroyed a large part of the Athenian walls. The Athenians advanced once more as their navy entered the Great Harbour and camped at Plemirium. As Syracuse was angrily switching generals, a dashing Gallippus arrived to save the day. He landed at Himera, where locals greeted him as a saviour, then marched towards Syracuse while a Corinthian boat under Gongolus slipped past the Athenians. Gallippus saw a gap on the northern heights near Epipoli, which Nicias had failed to secure, and slipped through. Nicias refused to engage, and Gallippus camped outside the city. The day after, he seized Labdalum, allowing Syracuse to build their wall through that area, cutting the Athenian lines in twain. Nicias responded by going to Plemirium at the southern entrance to the Great Harbour, where the Athenian navy was. Athens managed to fight and defeat Gigillus in the northern heights. Using this as a distraction, Gylippus engaged in a battle away from the walls. He used Syracusan cavalry and javelin throwers to rout the Athenian left flank. He then extended his own wall, stopping Athens from blockading. Athens began to lose morale, as more ships were able to break the blockade. Gylippus left to collect more allies in Sicily, and Syracuse sent envoys for more reinforcements. Nicias asked for more help from Athens, who sent another army under Eurymedon and Demosthenes of Pylos fame. By the spring of 413 BCE, the Peloponnesian relief force included 2,000 hoplites, while the Sicilian relief force had 2,300 soldiers. Athens received 250 Athenian cavalry, 30 mounted archers, 400 Sicilian mercenary cavalry, 5,000 hoplites, and 73 triremes. Gallippus asked Syracuse to attack the Athenian navy, but they failed miserably, as their own navy split into 35 triremes from the Great Harbour and 45 from the small harbour to the east. Athens deployed 25 ships to confront the former and 35 ships to the latter. At first, both Athenian forces were forced to retreat into the harbour, but the undisciplined Syracusans were destroyed in an ill-advised pursuit into that bottleneck. On land, the distraction of the naval battle allowed Gallippus to take the three forts at Plemirium. Athens was now trapped, like the Nemean lion under the arms of Heracles, as they were blocked from receiving supplies from the outside, while Syracuse's remaining ships attacked their navy with ramming attacks. Without room to maneuver, Athens lost many vessels. After a day's break, the defenders had pushed the Athenian navy fully out of their harbour. It was around this time that Demosthenes arrived and dashed to Epipoleia, likely to the cheers of the Athenians, to whom he must have appeared as a shining saviour. Demosthenes tried to attack Epipoleia during the night and initially took the Syracusan counterwall. However, once the locals formed up, they managed to push the Athenians back. The retreat turned into a disaster and the army's newly found confidence was shattered. The Athenian generals met and were forced to confront the direness of their situation. Demosthenes was now the moderate one, hoping to return to Athens, but Nicias dubiously claimed he knew Syracusan moles who would be willing to surrender the city to them. After much discussion, the army remained. However, no sooner had they made this decision, Gylippus returned with his reinforcements, causing Nicias to change his mind and discuss a retreat. As they were about to withdraw, a lunar eclipse occurred as Gaia hid Selene from her brother Helios. The soothsayers regarded this as a bad omen and demanded that the army wait 27 days before moving. So the army decided to wait for about a month, which allowed their enemies to blockade them. Many of the more superstitious men supported them, as fatally did Nicias. Right before the Athenians finally tried to leave, Syracuse dashed and broke through the Athenian walls. The day after, 76 Syracusan ships sailed forth to meet 86 Athenian response ships, beating the Ionian invaders in the attack. Athens managed to save the crews, a bittersweet consolation. Syracuse blocked the Great Harbour and essentially besieged Athens from within. Athens built a second wall to protect themselves as they would try to escape by sea and, if not, march to their nearest ally. 
Athens tried to use force by using their heavy ships to break through the enemy's forces, but ended up failing. Thus it was time to leave via land, which was risky, for the countryside was filled with Syracusan cavalrymen and enemy villagers. Syracuse also blocked all easily traversable overland routes with guards. Two days after losing at sea, the 40,000 survivors of the battle set forth, with Nicias at the front and Demosthenes at the back. They marched across Anipus and camped on a hill, but they settled in inhabited land the next day. On the third day, they realized the Acrean cliff they planned to travel through was blocked, and failed in pushing through after two attempts on two different days. On the fifth day, they fought once more and broke through, but only for a short distance, with supplies now running low. As night fell and Selene set forth on her chariot to Endymion, Nicias and Demosthenes tried to march elsewhere. Their new destination was Camarina or Gela. The night march ended with the two forces being split, with Demosthenes losing control over his half, which scattered. The next day, he was caught by the Syracusans, who surrounded his force and carpet-bombed them with javelins until Demosthenes surrendered with his 6,000 survivors. Nicias and his troops reached the river Erineus and took up a position on high ground. Syracuse eventually caught up with them, and then Nicias realized everyone else had surrendered. Nicias tried to bribe his way out, but the Syracusans bombarded them with javelins for an entire day. A night escape was planned, but that plan was discovered and foiled. The day after, the Athenians continued to the river Asinaris, where they were attacked while trying to drink water. Nicias tried to surrender to Gallippus, but the Syracusans continued their massacre. The few survivors were captured. Nicias and Demosthenes, the moderate and the radical, ended up being executed. Most of the few survivors would not see their homes again. They would be placed in a quarry where they would be forced into manual labor under horrible conditions. As the sun set on that fateful day, Athens's pride was crushed and its expeditionary force was destroyed. We can imagine the ghost of Orpheus playing a ballad to a weeping Athena herself, who was a patron goddess of both cities. We can also imagine a Syracusan and an Athenian mother crying before the hecatombs of their sons, cursing the ones who brought them to this spot. Like many powers before and since, they overcommitted and were blinded by their imperial goals, and thus ended up with a massive loss. Speaking of this campaign, Thucydides had this to say. The greatest action of all those that took place during the war, and so it seems to me, at least, the greatest of any which we know to have happened to any of the Greeks, it was the most glorious for those who won and the most disastrous for those who were defeated. However, the war was not over. The second phase of the war was yet to begin, and the political turmoil in Athens would be boiling. The conflict will return to all parts of Greece, from the Hellespont to the islands of Crete. To the east, in the land of Ahuras and Yazatas, the King of Kings was considering entering the geopolitical game, and we have yet to see what will become of Alcibiades. While we ponder what will happen and process through the massive chaos of the campaign, it is good to consider how war affects those who enter its jaws. The greatest distillation of this comes from a friend of Pericles and a predecessor in the art of history to Thucydides, Herodotus of Halicarnassus, who reminds us that No one should be so foolish to prefer war to peace, in which, instead of sons burying their fathers, fathers bury their sons. In the next episode, we will talk about the Persian Gambit. If you don't want to miss that episode, make sure to subscribe and press the bell button. Recently, we have started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive videos. Join the ranks of patrons and YouTube members via the link in the description or by pressing the button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, join our private Discord, and much more. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing. It helps immensely. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.